Well, good morning. Happy to be here. It's Friday the 13th. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> anyway, uh, let me just uh, let me just start and kind of go through what I want to talk about. I'll give you a, a couple of breaks, one kind of in the middle, one toward the end to kind of process what we're doing, and we'll just see where we go. So, uh, this is my welcome. I don't know if I, I get confused with these things. I'll read a little bit, you know. So, I'm happy to be here to talk with you about adulthood. The full, for me, adulthood is the fullness of the human. And what that might look like. And then what adult faith might look like. Because uh, I think the challenge of Jesus is for us to be adults and to have an adult faith. And I'm trying to offer some ways to look at these. Uh, this is not the gospel. But it's my way of trying to understand what's in the gospel, in a sense, what's there. The gospel is very good at talking about who God is, and very good at talking about our relationship with God, but it doesn't say a lot about who we are, except in that context. And so I'm trying to surface the human. Who is the human? Who are we as human and as approaching adulthood as we relate to God? Those are, those are the questions that are important. So this presentation. Part one, I want to talk about adulthood, what is an adult? And part two then, what is adult faith? Pretty clear? Pretty simple? Good. Uh, so part one, what is an adult? I think there are two essential hallmarks for being an adult. And the first is that an adult self is its own whole. It has integrity. It is integrity. And the second as, is that this whole or integral self relates in considered mutuality to whomever or whatever is other. I think that makes us adults. So let me talk about its own whole, this integrity. And the adult self, quite simply, is a self that has grown up, a self that has come into its own possession. It's its own person, able to stand on its own two feet. As we become adult, our locus of valuing moves from significant others who are outside of us to a place within the self. So that's crucial. We have within our own selves our valuing process. It's not what others tell us. We have to own that ourselves. It's, it's from within. So as we become adult, we become our own cohesive, felt from within, self-authoring whole. So a little bit more on that. The more adult and the more moral I become, the more integrity and mutuality necessarily go together. I believe they can't be divided. As I realize the one, I realize the other. And here's my understanding of integrity. And people love integrity for different reasons. Everyone's looking for people with integrity. But what does it mean? I think it means that the self owns all of its pieces. The loved and the unloved, the comfortable and the uncomfortable, the good and the bad. That's hard. And I think that's hard for us to become adult because it's hard for us often to own all the pieces, all of our experiences, especially if there's some experiences that were not very good or very shameful or traumatic or whatever. It makes it very difficult. Uh, yeah. What's considered mutuality? An adult self relates to whomever or whatever is other. I think family, family members, spouse, friend, events, groups, communities, institutions, animals, or the environment, any other you can think of, in a way that respects that other's difference, individuality, and boundaries. When we become adult, we relate to the other in whatever integrity that other has, with genuine concern for its unique character, particular history, and special needs. Does that make some sense? We okay? Yeah. That's, that's considered mutuality. A little bit more on that. There's three pieces that are in there that I'd like to, to simply highlight. First, considered mutuality finds the unique wholeness of the other. It's kind of what we just said. That's what we do if we, if we relate to others in mutuality. We're trying to find what makes them uniquely themselves, their unique wholeness. Secondly, considered mutuality is love and care for the other. It's quite simple, I think. Adults love and care for the other. 
It's not something that would be nice if we did. If we're adults, we do that. I think it's a hallmark of being an adult. And thirdly, considered mutuality insists on justice for the other. Uh, to me, that's, that's what considered mutuality looks like. So, hold us in mutuality. So it seems that integrity and mutuality go together, and that's the point. I'd like to make the, one of the reasons we revere people who have integrity is because we say, oh, that person has great integrity, and we look at them like there's something inside them that's just wonderful. But I think what really attracts us to people with integrity is that they relate to they relate to mutuality. They show respect for everybody. They have love and care for everyone. They insist on justice. That's why we're so comfortable with people with integrity. It's not just in them, it's the relating to everyone else that makes, it, makes that important. So integrity and mutuality, and we have to be clear here, as close as we can get to that, because we all have unfinished pieces, shortcomings, blind spots, cultural distortions. So, but even with all that, there's two things. It's the fullness of the human and a good description of what it means to be an adult. I want to talk about, out of those three ways that adults function, and I think this is especially helpful for understanding who we are in church today, because these are things I think we struggle with. So let me talk about these. One is voice, the second is intimacy, and the third is dialogue. So voice, these are just some pieces of it. Adult voice is from our integrity from the whole of our embodied selves and our experience. We need to say who we are and what we have come to know. We need to have a voice if we're adults. So voice is an invitation to make clear to ourselves and to others what we attest to, what we value, what's right, what's true. And the, there's a book, Women's Ways of Knowing, and it was very influential for me. Some of you may know the book, Women's Ways of Knowing. This is part of what they say. To have a voice is to have a self. And not to have a voice is in some ways not to exist, and certainly not to be in relationship. So a little more on voice. So to honor the other's voice is to respect the other and to acknowledge the other as an adult, or as at least on the way to becoming their own whole. Not to honor the other's voice is to treat the other as not being an adult. It's an absence of integrity. It's a, den a denial of mutuality. If we don't listen to the other's voice, that's what happens. We, we, some like, we denigrate their integrity. We deny mutuality. Not to honor the other's voice is to withhold loving care and justice. And then the question I always love, did Jesus respond to voice? And I'm just amazed, if you go through the Gospels, how Jesus responded to people's pleas, to what they said, especially when people cried out. Uh, the voice of the woman wanting justice late at night, knocking on the judge's door. I love that story. Why? She had voice. What is she asking for? She's asking for justice. And so uh, voice, I think, was absolutely crucial for Jesus. His own voice, clearly, but also listening to the voice of the other, which, which had a profound, obviously, a profound impact on him. So voice is crucial. There's more. Well, yeah, there is more. Intimacy. This is, we don't talk much about intimacy, but I want to try to flesh some of it out, what, it's, what I think it should look like in adulthood. It is voice that invokes closeness and intimacy. Voice invites intimacy. Here we are here now, we're talking to each other. Voice, voice is something that kind of calls us to each other. It calls for intimacy. Uh, we have two paradigms for learning in, in, that we usually get, and one is sight. And sight says, oh, can you see that? And it's some, like something objective at a distance. And the other paradigm for learning and for knowing is voice. It's what we can share together. It's really something that invites intimacy. And the knowing and the learning comes from the sharing, from the intimacy. So intimacy is to welcome the feeling and depth of the other, 
into the feeling and depth of the self. That's to me what an intimacy is and what it does. So intimacy honors the inner of the self, even as it honors the inner of the other. There's more. Empathy and intimacy go together. Without empathy, we cannot know the inner of the other. Adults have self-empathy. They're comfortable with their own inner. They can own their own inner, own all their own pieces, as we said. And adults uh, have empathy for the other person. That's how we know the other. That's intimacy. And I love this quote from Judith Jordan. Crucial to a mature sense of mutuality, observes Judith Jordan, is an appreciation of the wholeness of the other person with a special awareness of the other's subjective experience. Uh, that's a great quote. That's intimacy. That's, that's, that's empathy. It's like, it's crucial. That's a beautiful quote. And did Jesus pay attention to the inner? And again, I love this question, because if you look, all, Jesus all the time was talking about the inner. It's not the outside of the cup, it's the inner. It's not what comes out, it's, what, it's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean, it's what comes out. I mean, he, he feasted on the inner. That's adult. That's who we are. That's intimacy. Making sense? We okay? Okay. Dialogue. Dialogue is an exercise in voice and an exercise in intimacy. This is adult dialogue. This is what it's meant to be, I think. It's an exercise in voice and an exercise in intimacy. Dialogue is on the basis of the whole self's experience. Welcome the other's experience. Dialogue doesn't work when we talk about different positions that we hold. Dialogue works when one person shares experience with the other and the other shares experience back. That's how we learn. That's intimate. That's when voice is heard. That's how it works. So dialogue is the wholeness of the self engaging the other in mutuality. In dialogue, often both parties change or are changed. Adult dialogue is often a way of transformation. I think is how it happens. A little more dialogue. I love this. I, I keep saying this all the time. Adults dialogue. I think it's as simple as that. Adults dialogue. That's what they do. That's what they need to do. It's, it's who we are in this kind of framework that we're talking about. Without the possibility of dialogue, voice is silenced and intimacy in relationship is thwarted. Without knowing the inner of each other, two things happen. Change and transformation do not occur, and the adult integrity and mutuality of both parties is compromised. The Jesus dialogue. Yeah, all over. He was in dialogue with anyone, with everyone. The woman at the well, I mean, it's dialogue that's happening. The inner of him re being revealed. By the Jesus changed, and that story of the woman at the well. He changed. He became different in relating to her. She brought things out of him that he had never said before. And he brought things out of her that she didn't know. That's change, that's transformation, that's dialogue. Well, it's early in the morning, and this is, this is kind of heavy in its own way, so we're going to have a little interlude. Can you briefly talk, one or two people next to you, maybe at the table in general, uh, does any of this understanding of adulthood make sense to you? And do you think voice, intimacy, and dialogue go together in adults? Take maybe five, six, seven minutes, just talk among yourself. Does this make any sense? What, what, what do you want to hold on to? What do you want to challenge? Grapple with this. Before I let this piece go and start to talk about adult faith, I'd just like to make one observation, which for me is kind of like a benchmark or whatever. Uh, and it's kind of an, an imago dei theology. And it's this, if we're in the image and likeness of God, and if being adult is the fullness of the human, and if that's an integrity and mutuality, is God integrity and mutuality? And guess what? To me, that's a great definition of the Trinity. Integrity and mutuality. If we're in the image and likeness of God, 
That's who we are. And when we're fully ourselves, we're integrity and mutuality, I think we're fully in the image and likeness of God. Make some sense? So, part two. We want to talk, start talking about adult faith. And this is pretty much from the book. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want to make the case for it, and I don't want to do it the way I did it there, because I think it's the clearest way I know how to do it. These are questions in the book. The book is really about this. What got me started trying to work on this was, why is I relating to God so often presented as if it were something static and not something meant to develop as we ourselves develop and mature? And coming out of that, the question then is, why are so many adults still living with a God of childhood and adolescence, what I call a superego God? And can we describe this God? And can we describe a God of adulthood, what I, what I would like to call a living God? So that's what we want to do. So, I think then there's two paradigms of imaging God. There's a superego God paradigm, and there's a living God paradigm. So let me talk about the first, because the superego God paradigm has three components. There's an adolescing self. The word adolescing simply means still coming to adulthood. I love that word because as we're on the way to adulthood. So it's not like we're children, we are children, but we're on our way to adulthood. We're still, at, we're adolescing. And I want to say that while we're still coming to adulthood, the way we image reality is still coming to adulthood. It's still growing up. And so it's still, it's one way I'd like to, it's clear to say it, it's fettered. It's not completely realistic. It's not whole yet. Because we're not whole yet. We're not, we're not integral yet. Our imaging is not whole yet. So we have fettered imaging. And so I want to say, while we're still growing up, and while our imaging is still not whole, fettered, the way we image God is not whole. And so an adolescent self with fettered imaging finds a superego God. So that's, that's the thesis. So let's talk about an adolescent self. And from the perspective of adulthood, it's pretty simple. There's two characteristics. We're still forming. We're still coming into our own whole. And as long as we're still forming, we're dependent on someone else to know who we are and what we should do. As long as we're still forming, we're dependent on something outside to be ourselves. So an adolescent self is still forming and still dependent, as it should be. That's what, that's what it is to grow up. That's the state we're in as we're growing. We're still forming and we're still depending on other people to find out who we are and to find out what the right thing to do is and how we should be and even who we are because we don't know and everyone tells us who we are. We sort that out and we're trying to come to that ourselves. So, what's fettered imaging then? It's imaging of reality that's still forming and still dependent. And it has three strands. I think the strands make it kind of easy to see. There's a lot of fantasy in fettered imaging. Fantasy is typically what I wish were there or what I think needs to be there in order to make a picture that I can understand. So when we're little, we, we see reality with a lot of fantasy because we need to. And so we don't fully understand things like when parents get divorced, little kids say, oh, it was my fault. It's my fault, that's typical. Little kids say, it's my fault that my parents got divorced. They don't see, they see little pictures. They, they, there's a lot of fantasy in that. What are they trying to do? They're trying to paint a picture of reality that makes sense to them. And that's what we do. But it may not be real at all. And as we get older, we say, oh, I understand now what was happening was this and this, and we have all these things, and we get, oh, now I see, now I understand. 
Before that, we don't see completely, so that's fantasy. Relating and transference, it's a word from, from Freudian thought, whatever, but the idea is we relate to others while we're still growing for what they can do for us to grow up. And the simple thing here is your mother and your father is your mother and your father. You know what I mean? We define that person in terms of who they are for us. If you think about it, that's what we do. Oh, that's my mother. No, my mother was Virginia, and she had a whole life before I knew her, and later, toward the end of her life, I got to know her in a completely different way, which is wonderful when that happens. It was kind of like an adult-to-adult -adult way. That, you know what we're talking, you know what I'm talking about? Often that doesn't happen. But then I got to know, but because before that, I'm growing up, that's my mother, that's my father. So, and we need that to get a sense of ourselves. So we relate in transference, drawing from others what we need for our own becoming. And this third piece is more coming out of the culture, and we get this, typically we get this in high school, because they say, oh, you gotta, you gotta learn scientific method. And if you really want to know what's real, it's science. And we have all these procedures that I'll tell you. And so that reality is objective. And we live in a culture that says that very much. So that you can objectively know things. And if it's not objective, it's not true, or you can't trust it, whatever. But then the older we get, relationships aren't objective. Most of the things in life aren't, religion's not objective. Most of the things don't fit that paradigm. Well, we try to squeeze God into that paradigm. Uh, even the churches try to do that, you know, logical proofs for the existence of God, like it's, you can actually objectively talk about this. That's fettered imaging as well, so the logic of objective knowing. And we all get that, especially in high school it's very, and later on as well. Nothing wrong with science, nothing whatsoever. But as a complete way of dealing with reality, it, 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 can't, it can't carry it, it doesn't carry. So. If we're adolescent selves and we have fettered imaging, then I want to say we find a superego God. And these are the five ways I describe this God. I'll say a little bit about each one. First, the superego God is a supreme being. And we all say that all the time. Almighty God, we say. You know. But the image, two things in this image, if you think about it. The first is power. This is a very powerful God. I think of Charlton Heston in, in, in the movies, you know, ah, Yahweh is, you know, it's this amazingly powerful uh, presence, but also with the power, very distant. In fact, nothing like us at all, completely other. And we use that phrase, wholly other, but at the same time, very much interested in what we do looking out for all the things that we do or don't do. So it's really an interesting thing that we have. But this idea of supreme being, that's, the, that's when we're small, that's how we, that's how we capture God. And it works in childhood and adolescence, and it works well. It does not work, I want to say, in adulthood, but we'll get to that. This supreme being turns out to be a god of law. And so we, there's all these laws that we learn, as especially growing up. God is the law, because if you obey the law, you're okay with God. God is law. The superior God is a God of law. And belief. Now, beliefs are very important. But here, God is the belief. It's like very important to have the right belief. Because if you have the right belief, then you have God. And a lot of people do a lot of things. There's a lot of discussion about who believes this and who believes in this isn't right and everyone. So, belief is a big thing. But God is in the belief. And the important thing is, to have the right belief is to have God. It's not a relationship. It's a belief. God's in the belief. And with all this, it's a God that we're dependent on, very much so. And of course you say, of course we're dependent on God. It's a God of dependency, but it's also a God that we're controlled by. And growing up, we don't like the dependency, or we do, and usually we don't like the control. 
And the question always is, is it my life to lead? Or is it, God, is, is it God's life? Who's in charge of my life? And so there's a question of dependency and a question of control. And where do we find this God? We find this God in the group. And I'm kind of defining the group simply as the place where the supreme being is celebrated. And the God of law and the God of belief and the God of dependency and control are celebrated as well. You could call that church, but if it's church, it's a superego kind of church. But that happens. So typically, we, the group is very important. And the group can be very, very reassuring and comforting, but the group also can be kind of cruel. You can be expelled from the group if, you're, if you don't conform. There's, there's some ambivalence about this, about this group. That's the superego God. Let me say a little bit more to give, to give some flavor of this. It's a God of good and evil together. Typically we separate, separate, separate evil out. And typically at this level, it's like there's God and there's the devil. And they're fighting each other in competition. We're not sure how that's working, but that's, 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 that's you know, there's God and there's the devil. And some people see evil in God, whatever. So, but this, it's a God of good and evil. It's a God of conditional acceptance. You're loved if you obey, if you have the right beliefs, if you obey the law. Uh, this superego God is a God we know about and learn about. We get this God. We get it from the culture. We get it from organized religion. It's not a God of personal experience. You might say, well, yeah, that's my experience. That's what God is. But it's not a God of personal experience. It's not a relational God. It's the God of conventional religion and is very much the God understood in the culture. In, in, this is American religion. And this, is, this is pretty much what it looks like. Does it make some sense? Get the picture? Okay. Oh, more. Oh, yeah, I want to talk about this. This is something helpful to, to say to yourself with the superego God. How do we hear this God? I mean, what's the communication like? How do we hear this God? The voice of this God be, can be kind and loving, but also can be critical. And often it is kind of critical because typically we don't conform too well. So it's interested in controlling the adolescent self through either love or fear. And typically it goes back and forth between love and fear. The other thing with this voice, it's usually immediate, there in the mind, it's in the mind, it's like it's in our head already, often loud, attacking, harsh, critical, judgmental, guilt evoking, and punishing. All that good stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's like you're thinking of doing something, you're, you're a kid or a teenager, you're thinking of doing something bad or whatever, and the voice of the superior guy says, you're thinking of what? Don't even think of, don't even, don't do that, don't even think of doing that, you know? You hear this voice in your head. It's the superego God. That's what, it, that's what it sounds like. Harsh, loud, tick, uh, critical, judgmental. Typically that's, what, that's, how, that's how we hear God. How do we speak about this God? We talk about this God in literal terms, as we would talk, talking about any other object. Because this God is the supreme being, it's like the supreme object. And we talk about it like we could describe it as an object. And we talk, about, we talk to this God very much as a child talks to an adult or to an authority figure. Because it's a superego God. Get the picture of that? Yeah. Uh, our hope is that we've kind of left that behind. But not everyone and not always. And I have to say this. To leave the superego God is difficult because the superego God doesn't take rejection lightly. It's true. It does not. 
it takes courage and what you need is some support from other people you need like spiritual direction is good someone to support you in that journey because it's if you're trying to to get past the superego god it feels like you're denying god in some sense it feels like you're losing your faith the power of this god is it, it's it's immense it's very powerful god so this is not an easy we're talking like this you just well i'll just change from the super ego to something we're going to talk about next it's very hard to do you need support you need support and you need challenges typically when people have severe illness or some kind of trauma typically they either fly back to the super ego god and with vengeance or that they realize that the super ego god didn't protect them it wasn't there whatever and they move to something more adult so some some often some kind of crisis has something to do with moving from the super ego to the living god let me talk a bit about the living god it's a paradigm again with three pieces an adult self unfettered imaging and a living god and so the paradigm is an adult self with unfettered imaging is able not always does but is able at least to find a living god so let me talk about that adult self we've already seen this two essential hallmarks of being an adult self adult self is its own whole and this whole or integral self relates in considered mutuality to whomever whatever is other that's adult Let's, we've been talking about that unfettered image is kind of simple in a way this is an imaging of reality that comes freely and fully from the adult self and, the, and one way to say it simply the second way is that it's an image of reality no longer hampered by fantasy we don't have a lot of fantasy as adults we're not only relating in transference because we we've grown up we don't need others to be ourselves and the logic of objective knowing goes by the way because we realize that most of the important things in life aren't objective and we can't know them objectively so uh, this is an imaging of reality that comes from the being whole and it lets us find the wholeness of the other and considered mutuality so that's what, how the, this imaging works so an adult self with unfettered imaging is able to find a living god these characteristics of the living god are transformations of the characteristics of the superego god so the living god is a god as thou for, for some people it's something like a spiritual presence but for most people it's it's personified it's a thou but the key thing here it's relational it's an experience of relationship the superego god is not relational this god is relational and what is this god it's not law anymore the law was important but the law was for the relationship the law was for the love to be with the god of thou it's a god of love and the beliefs are important but the living god is a god of mystery because we can never fully know the beliefs don't begin to capture the reality of god god is mystery mystery doesn't mean it's not something we know we don't know mystery means there's something we enter into that we're part of that's more than we can say but that's real very real god is mystery and the living god is not dependency and control anymore it's a god of freedom saint augustine said love god and do what you will and i said well yeah okay oh yeah anything oh, love god and do what you will yeah great thing i entered for the book i interviewed a, it was not in the book but i interviewed a moral theologian and i was surprised i said what's your image of god i said i'm trying to understand when you think of god what image comes to your mind and he right away he said freedom freedom it's powerful the living god is a god of freedom god is freedom and we enter into that we enter into that freedom which again that's some ways somewhat scary whatever it's and we're part of that we participate in the freedom we are with the god of freedom the god of freedom is in us it's the mutuality 
And where do we find this God and where do we celebrate this God? It's the community. So this will be a nice segue for Jane. Because we desperately need the community, that's where we celebrate our experience of God. That's where we are in mutuality to listen to other people and to, to learn from them and to see from them how God is in their lives and what, what, what differences this make and what this means. You, you can't celebrate the living God by yourself. It doesn't work. Of course, in Christianity, it doesn't work at all. But you can't. You desperately need the community, but not with laws and not with not, not in a kind of rigid kind of super ego God way. You need community to celebrate the living God. And liturgy is meant to do that. Good liturgy celebrates the living God. Good liturgy connects us with the God as thou, is the celebration of the God of love. Is there's mystery there and we know it, we're part of it. We can't name it necessarily, but we know it, we're part of it. If you, if good liturgy, you leave good liturgy and it's like, it's like you feel, you know what I mean? It's like you feel free, it's like it, it just enlivens you, it lets you be yourself. It's, it's a freeing thing. Why? We're with, we're with the God of freedom. We celebrated that God, and that's what's there. And that's what community is. The liturgy is the community. It's the celebration of the community. It's the celebration of the living God in community. A little bit more. So the living God, we've made this case, is the transformation of the superego God. The living God is a God of unconditional love, a God we relate to in mutuality and intimacy. Power is not a big thing. This God, the almighty God, no, no. Is there power? If there is, it's a much more kind of personal sense. It's not the power. It's not Charlton Heston. It's not, it's not there. It's simply not there. This God doesn't promise salvation like the superior God does. To be with the living God is an experience of being healed, of coming to some kind of wholeness. It's an experience of salvation. That's the living God. Uh, okay. So being in this, with this living God, there's a kind of synergy or shared energy and empowerment in God, which makes the adult self more integral, even as it moves the self deeper into the reality of the living God. So how do we hear this God? This is important to say, how am I with time? We get getting... fine, good. Uh, how do we, hear... not do, but do, how do we hear this God? This is hard to say, but I think very important to say. It's kind of like a voice, if you want to think of it that way, but it's in the wholeness of the body. It's like a voice that comes from within, from the inner, from the feeling and the depth that we have. So it's a voice of and it's, uh, yeah, for, for the body and its feeling and its depth. It's not this strong outer voice of the superego God, but there is a voice. But you have to kind of be quiet to, to listen to it, for it to surface and for it to come. It's not a demanding voice at all. It's very quiet, but it's there. It's the voice it tends to be the voice of the self and God together, because with the living God, the self and God are together. It's a quiet inner voice of genuine care and concern for the self and for the other together. And I think this is a voice of conscience, of dialogue. It's a voice of vocation. People, you know, oh, I feel called to this, whatever, you know. Called? Who called? It's voice. Okay. Where'd you hear this voice? Did someone call you? When I interviewed for the book, I asked people. A number of people said, I've, yeah, I've heard, I've heard God speaking to me. And they said, oh, no, I'm not crazy. And they'd all say, I'm not crazy. But they heard a voice. I think it's this kind of voice. And my hunch is a lot of us here have heard the vo what it calls us to what we're doing. Is it God's voice? Yes. Is it my voice? Yes. Is it both? Yes. Is it quiet and gentle and wanting to draw us forward? Yes. I think that's more like it's conscience, dialogue, and vocation. How do we speak about this God? We talk about this God in the language of metaphor. Adults love metaphor and adults love. You can't speak about experience without using metaphor. Uh, because anything personal, you have to say, oh, it was like, it was really good. It was like, you know, and we use some kind of metaphor. And you might say, it was here this morning, it was good, but you know, it was a little bit heavy. You might say that, or it was like, ooh. We use metaphors, and we use metaphors for God. And you say, yeah, the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah, a shepherd? Yeah, well, yeah. It's metaphor. Metaphor is not a figure of speech. 
We, we were taught that in grade school and high school. It is, but, you can use, but that's not what metaphor is. Metaphor is a way of touching the deeper parts of the self. It's the way of touching the body and its feeling and its depth. Literal, literal words don't work. But metaphor works. And metaphor is just as true as literal language. It's simply it's adult. But it's, it's even more true. But it's metaphor. So we talk to this God in metaphor also, because metaphor is the language of the whole self of feeling and depth and intimacy. People, when they share intimacy, they use all these metaphors. And so they say honey and deer. What, you know, did anybody do this? Yeah, what? It's a metaphor, but it's the one that works. It captures the reality. And so, yeah. So, okay. Oh, yeah, an interlude. Do I have, have a week for time? Okay. Uh, we'll do questions later, or maybe... Uh, we can do questions all together at the end, we can do now. Okay. Okay. You know what I'd like, though? I'd like a little interlude to talk at the table. What are you hearing with this? Because some people won't ask questions and some people would Take about five minutes just to process this at the table. Does this make any sense? Do any parts of this understanding of adult faith make sense to you? Does it make sense that the God we know about and learn about is so different from a God that we experience and have a mutual relationship with? Take a little bit of that. We have about... Maybe five minutes for questions. But before we do that, uh, this, this summer I was on a directed retreat in New York. And uh, the highlight of the retreat, a wonderful direction, but the highlight of, of the retreat was the liturgy. And uh, the reason it was so good, I think, was that God is thou. God of love, God of mystery, freedom, community, was all beautifully celebrated. And in the one who did the celebration, a former student of mine, Francis Gargani, who's here today, and a gift, and I want to say this even publicly, absolute gift, because the liturgy, when it's done that way, it's, it, it's, it's incomparable. So that's the piece. If you, if you, liturgies here are good. If you, if you experience that kind of liturgy, this gets celebrated and is crucial. Thank you. Now, all the questions you were asking, John, at the end of the session, like, what do we do? How do we provide these opportunities? How do we do that? We're going to be looking at that. I'm not going to have the answers to it, but I certainly have a way of framing the question and helping you to frame the question in your own pastoral setting. So as we're going to be looking at that is that notion of how we are and how we become, how we live out of and become um, an adult church. That should be an adult church. I realize it. Uh, adult church. <laughs> um, first of all, let me talk about some of the givens that I have. These givens are just things that if we were here for months and months, we would, um, I would talk about this. But unless those doors get sprung short, my bet, close, I, my bet is that you're not going to want to stay much more than about an hour. Okay? So I, I've got a few things I just want to say that I'm just going to assume them. Okay? We're not going to, I'm not going to argue them, just so we're all on the same basic page. The first one is that the church, and therefore the local parish, exists in order to evangelize. In other words, what are we doing and why are we doing it? Everything we're doing, we have to hold it up against the call, the challenge, the invitation to the church to be an evangelizing agent. And by evangelization, I mean, and this is again um, from Evangelion Nanti Andi, Ian, evangelization is bringing the good news into all strata of humanity and through its influence transforming humanity from within and making it new. Okay? So it's not proselytizing, it's not bringing folks in. Although it would be lovely if we had more Catholics and more smart Catholics, it would be even nicer, okay? But it's, it's instead about sending us out, preparing us to, to go out. Um, the faith community has a responsibility, therefore, to fashion adults who engage in service for membership and, more importantly, for mission. You know, and more importantly, to be evangelizing agents, okay? To be people whose lives are, are transformative and inviting and give evidence of God's presence 
Okay? So that people say, wow, you know, and they ask us for the reason for our hope. Okay? That's evangelizing. Okay? All right. Which means, therefore, when we're talking about adult church and evangelizing church, those are pretty much the same thing. You know, uh, evangelizing church is, is the same as or, or pretty close to an evangelizing church. Okay, same thing. All right. So then the question we're going to be looking at is, how do we go about being and becoming an adult church? Okay? What does that look like, and how do we go about doing it? Okay, and I'm going to do, use an image for this today. Okay? The image is a dock. Okay? See that nice dock in a nice water, calm. Let's go there. No, no, wait. wait, wait, wait. No, 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 we have to stay here. Okay. And what I want to propose is that dock is an evangelizing parish. Okay? All analogies have weak spots, and this one does too, okay? So, but just bear with me as I go through this, okay? And each of the little planks on the dock are ways in which the parish is being formed in being and becoming an adult church. Okay? Pretty cool so far, right? Okay. So we know what some of the planks are then. There's going to be programs for adults, there's going to be catechist formation, um, there's going to be parish gatherings, there's going to be sacramental formation, peer group sessions, scripture study, youth ministry, and all kinds of other things that are about shaping a people to be and become an adult, and be, become, be and become adult church. We're going to talk about that a bit more in a bit. Okay, so this is great. So we get all these things together, we line them all up, and we put them in the water as a dock. But they all fall apart because they're not connected. Okay, so it's like, then they float out and a big wave comes and some of them sink and it's a mess. Okay, so that's not going to work. Okay, we have to think about, okay, then what do we have to do? Okay, well, we need to first put in place the framing that we build the dock on. You can't just put boards on the water, huh? Okay, so we have to put the frame that we build, we put the um, boards on. Some of the things that make up the frame is that it's rooted in liturgy, that it's oriented to evangelization. Okay, those are some of the, some of the framing pieces that make up the foundation on which we put process and programs and ways of being in relationship. Okay? Other things include there's a level of inclusiveness that everyone everyone is is engaged in the process that it's educationally sound that the um, that we're engaging in formation that we're engaging in being and becoming a church in a way that's educationally coherent educationally sound um, that it's uh, multi generational I use the term multi generational in my writing um, not. Because I often think when we use the term intergenerational, it ends up sounding like mom and dad and little kids. Do you know what I mean? That's often the image we get of intergenerational. Kind of, it really means the parents of second graders and their kids going on a retreat. Okay, that's that's often how it gets translated. As a matter of fact, in many parishes, what I would argue is for a multi-generational which means all the generations are involved, sometimes together, sometimes apart, sometimes in small groups, sometimes in lecture. So everybody's engaged, okay? Not necessarily together all the time, though sometimes they are together, okay? So that's, I find multi-generational a bit better uh, than intergenerational, which sounds like we're always inter with one another. I have teenagers. I don't want to be intergenerational with my teenagers. <laughs> Why would I want to? Um, okay, all right, so we build this now, okay, and then we're going to make it part of that, kind of frame those in, see, now we got this, put it on the water, and there it goes, it floats away. Well, that's not very helpful. How are we going to get on it? We want to be talking about our, this is what we're actually talking about today, the foundations, the pilings that are sunk deep into our tradition, deep into our identity, deep into our way of being, that serve as the foundation around which we build both the frame and the boards. I think sometimes in some parishes, probably not in none of your parishes, I'm sure, but I think sometimes in some parishes we do programs and then we set them off and we don't know why they sink. 
sometimes I think they sink because what we need is some foundation pieces in place. Okay. Now, I think there's a lot of them. I mean, I think there's a, more than the three I'm looking at. Um, but these three, I believe, are key. They connect very clearly with what it means to be a person of adult faith that John just talked about. And they give us a way of moving in the direction of being and, and becoming an adult church. And the three of them are hospitality, conversation, and followership. So those are kind of like the pilings that we build the um, we build the dock on. Okay? Hospitality, conversation, and followership. And actually the way I use conversation is very sort of almost identical to the way John uses dialogue. Okay. Um, it's word choice. Not much difference. Followership. I will be. Okay? Yeah, followership. I know follower. Who wants to be a follower? Lamb. <laughs> okay. All right, but we're going to, because in fact what we want to do is, absolutely, what we want to do is we want to look at that my argument here is that that capacity for conversation, genuine conversation, okay, which addresses to some extent that question of how do we help people to begin to question this super ego God, one of the ways to do it is to have them in conversation with other people about things that matter in their lives. Because it is in fact where we recognize that our lives are not, they're not doing well with this super ego God. And, and when we hear, even better, other people speaking about a relationship with God, that we begin to make some shifts, begin to think differently. I remember very clearly working with a group of adults. It was a sacramental formation program in the parish where I live. This is one of those times when um, you know, the, everybody's there. And many times it's um, that the uh, women are there, the mothers are, are there. And, um, but there's one, there's one group for some reason. I had a group of about five guys who came every time. Okay, so they took over the guy table in the back, okay? <laughs> and, which was great. They had some great conversations. And at the end of one of the conversation periods, um, one of the guys said, we were talking about prayer, and he said, you know, I've never even thought about prayer in the way that he does prayer. Wow. You know? And that he does prayer is somebody he was sitting around the group with, some other some other dad. You know? And that that sense of his kind of yearning for that is the beginning of that movement from a, um, a, a super, a potentially super ego God to a, a living God. Okay, capacity for conversation, effective followership, radical hospitality, all those are feeding one another. See, what I want to do for each of them is to deconstruct our present usage. Okay, because I think in each case, each of them, followership, hospitality, and conversation, we have a certain kind of common usage of how we use that term. and. I think we need to deconstruct that a bit. I think it's been minimalized. Um, then I want to look at the scripture and tradition to say, how could we use this term? What are the resources to rethink those terms? Then proposing an alternative understanding and then drawing some pastoral implications. Okay, you can see why I'm only doing three. <laughs> All right, so the first thing I want to do is this notion of hospitality. Now, when we think of hospitality, and if you look up hospitality on Google, which is my primary research base is Google, okay, um, we have things kind of like hospitality room, hospitality industry, hospitality committee, okay. Um, you, have, you could also get hospitality mints, okay. Um, hospitality furniture, okay, all kinds of things for hospitality. In each of these cases, hospitality has been reduced, I think, in some, in some ways, um, to being nice to one another or to personalizing an imp a potentially impersonal experience. So I go into the hotel and I, I register in the hotel and um, then when I call from the phone where in my room to ask for something, they answer with, yes, Miss Regan, how can I help you? Okay, how did they know that? Okay, well, no, they didn't remember me. No, this is not my friend. Okay, my name comes up on the caller ID. Okay, do you see? And that's part of their understanding of hospitality. I, I like it. I mean, I like mints on my bed at night. You know, that's so sweet. Come in your little chocolate on your pillow. But, um, so I'm not against that kind of hospitality, but that's not all of hospitality. Okay, or a hospitality committee in a parish, great. I, coffee and donuts after mass is just is great. I like it. Okay, 
That's not everything though. And a matter of fact, for some people's experiences, parishes that are really good at being hospitable to one another aren't always all that hospitable to outsiders. Okay, so that's not always a good thing. Okay. So it seems to me that we're talking about hospitality, that it basically connotes comfort and convenience, okay? And it's often either based on agreement or coming from our excess. Like we don't offer hospitality from our own need. We offer hospitality from our excess, often. Okay. And that's certainly the way it's being used kind of in, in contemporary culture. So hospitality is really throwing nice parties. Again, a good thing, but not, not a foundation on which to build a parish. Okay. So to look at hospitality in scripture, we can look at three different stories, which I just want to talk about very quickly to kind of get a sense of what's going on in those stories. Each one of these would be a great like study to say what's hospitality like in our parish community, okay? The first is the visitors for Sarah and Abraham. Okay, um, you have the scene, you know, they're, they're in the desert because where they live, you know, they're nomads and uh, they're wandering around and somebody comes to visit, okay, three people actually come to visit. And because they're nomads in that, in that culture, hospitality wasn't just something you had to do because it was nice. It was essential because you can't simply send somebody off, you know, good luck, God bless, next tent is, you know, across the desert to the right, you know. You really do have to, in fact, offer hospitality for, for living, for survival. And so, and they did. They offered hospitality. They extended that hospitality. They welcomed the guests in. They came. And in that experience, in fact, they welcomed angels. And in many of the uh, stories within the um, uh, Old Testament particularly, that when we welcome the stranger, we in fact welcome, welcome God, okay, and welcome, welcome angels and messengers of God. It was out of that context then that Sarah um, was told that she was going to have a child, and it was really the beginning of the, uh, you know, beginning of the father Abraham's role as as, as father of, of many nations. The promise that God had given him. So that notion of hospitality, then, first of all, is that in welcoming the stranger, we welcome God. Another piece to this that I haven't really worked in here yet because I'm clearly I'm working on a book. This is the outline. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So any ideas will be well received. Um, but another part of that welcoming the stranger piece is that sense in the Old Testament particularly that, that the Israelites understood themselves as strangers. We are strangers in a strange land. That sense they were always exiles. There's something more there that I want to that I want to play with in looking at the at the Old Testament uh, Old Testament stories. But then let me look at the, the next one, which is the parable of the uh, of the great banquet. That's the story about um, uh, guys holds a big banquet. He goes and finds invites everybody in, and one couple says, "Well, we can't. Cause we've got super saver tickets to go to the Bahamas, and we can't lose a ticket, so we're going to the Bahamas. We're not going to your party." See, when they first got the invitation, they understood to be an invitation. And they were quite excited because this guy throws really good parties. Okay. After a while, it became an obligation. You know, they put it on their calendar, like another thing on the calendar, you know? And it just happened that the tickets to the Bahamas came up and it overlapped with this party, okay? Oh well, see it's an obligation that I'm balancing out rather than this invitation, okay? So they can't come. Another one just bought a house and the closure is that day and he has to be there at the closing and there's some difficulty with uh, uh, inspection and okay, he can't go. So he goes through all these people who had been invited and said they were coming, who now says they're not. Out of that came the extravagant gesture of welcoming in anybody the lame, the, those who are on the streets, inviting everybody in. That was an extravagant gesture, a beyond belief. Most of Jesus' parables are, in fact, beyond, like, at the time, we listen to them and nod while we're kind of making our grocery list in our mind kind of thing. But, in fact, for people who first heard it, who would do that? You've got to be kidding. You know, you just wouldn't do that. 
Okay. And continue to invite people in. And the house still is full? Fine. Go back out again and get some more. That welcoming in the ones who, in fact, are not welcome. That's the key. That sense of hospitality. And it's a hospitality that is extravagant. It's beyond belief. Okay. In some ways, it's beyond belief the way a living God is beyond a superego God. It's beyond belief. It's beyond belief, belief to love. And then finally, we have the story of the sheep and the goats. That's a great story where, you know, everybody's kind of getting ready to get into heaven and they get separated out. And to one group, he says, um, you know, when I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. And they said, really? Cool. Okay, and to the other group, you know, when you were, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, they said, "When did that happen?" No, I, I I've been paying attention. If I'd seen you, I would have. If I'd seen you, I would have. But they didn't see. They didn't like see the stranger. They didn't see the other. Okay, so it's that sense of how do we see? It's seeing with hospitable eyes. It's seeing with extravagant generosity. Okay, hospitality. So that ultimately the sheep and the goats, one of the key, key punchlines to that one is that it's essential to following Christ, to who Christ is. That we're called to be extravagantly hospitable. Not, not just because we are going to be welcoming God, but because we are going to be welcoming the other. And that's our job. Okay, um, uh, hospitality. Okay, so what does this mean? What does this look like in terms of a parish? How, do, how does a parish become? A, are you getting a sense of hospitality? Because hospitality, again, all of these actually, are not, isn't something we do. It's a way that we are. Okay, so it's not that like, we now we need to get somebody to do hospitality in the parish. Hospitality committees are great if they're serving as catalysts for the broader experience of hospitality. Okay, so um, how do we become a hospita hospitable parish? I think first of all, make it a habit. A habit of hospitality. How are um, people welcomed and greeted in our parish communities? And how are they welcomed and greeted not just in the church, okay, like not just coming into the church building, but in general? Like how do we, how do we meet people? How do we greet them? I think one of the primary expressions of hospitality in a, in a parish community is the person who answers the phone, okay? You get it? Okay. This is nobody in this nobody in this building has a has a secretary like this. But I've heard about secretaries. You know. Yeah. Say no to the good. You want to have your job up? Great. Okay. Are you a member here? Uh huh. You're not. Oh, you are. You think you are? Okay. Well, we have a program that lasts this long. And envelope number, please. Okay. Fine. Never asked, boy, girl. How you doing? Are you exhausted? When did you sleep last? Okay. It's about about here. Right? It's not about it's not about welcoming. It's about setting up the demands. You know, the more I listen to John, the more I'm seeing that some of what I'm I'm saying, this is just from is like that's the difference between a superego God and a living God. Superego God is about you remember here, when were you last here, what's your envelope number, okay? I'm sorry, if you're not an active member of the parish, then we don't do baptism with people who are not active members of the parish. Right? Does that make sense? You know, and, now, and the thing is that this, the, the, I, I want to be really clear, this living God isn't just in my sense, John can correct me if I'm wrong on this, this living God isn't, co oh sure, who cares? No, the living God cares deeply but not about laws, but about the relationship. So the, the welcoming is to welcome at a time when the, um, when the person is reaching out to grab it and not to slap it. You know, if they're reaching out their hand, we grab the hand, we don't slap the hand, okay? Secondly, creating hospitable space. You know, our parishes, many, many of them are lovely. Um, where do we gather, though? You know, what's that experience? 
What's the experience of welcome and warmth? I'm not talking about a building campaign, although goodness knows many of our parishes could use a building campaign, but how do we make the connection between our gathering for liturgy and kind of the gathering of the community before and after that? You know, what's that experience like? And how do we foster that? Um, how do we enhance the welcome of our, the appearance of welcome? What does our website look like? Our parish websites. How, how are they welcoming? You know, all of the ways in which our parish welcomes. How much information is on the billboard thing in the front of the church? How much of that is accurate? Now, this sounds silly, but it's not. Okay, it's ways in which we reflect that hospitality. A second element of a hospitable parish is to recognize who is not present. That's a power of what they call it within educational circles as a null curriculum. What do we say by what we don't say? Or what do we say by who we exclude? All right, so what's, how do we, as a hospitable parish, how do we become more aware of who is not present? Okay, quick story. Um, parish, this is a story about a congregation, actually. It was during, uh, the, right at the beginning of um, the U.S. involvement in World War II. And this it happened in Chicago. And it, um, there was a, a congregation there, fairly conservative, you know, just small, in, in Chicago, kind of toward, in the city, kind of Chicago. Now during that time, there, the, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, many Japanese Americans, as we know, um, uh, experienced a good deal of, of prejudice and discrimination. And one such group was a small community of Christians um, who, uh, who were meeting in a storefront, um, kind of for their church, you know, they went to the storefront. And um, well, after the, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, their contract ran out, or their lease ran out, or their lease was canceled, whatever. And they were evicted from their place to, to worship. So they went around to all the Christian communities in the area to get permission to use their place for worship. And they would say, you know, we don't need much space. We just need, and we'll come at a time that you're not using it. We just need a place to gather for prayer and for fellowship, you know, for support. Okay. Right. Nope, sorry. No, oh, geez, no, we're busy, busy, busy place. All the rooms are used all the time. No, can't, no, you can't. Okay, so they're finally getting to really about the last chance. This, this fairly old, staid church in Chicago, and, and they're thinking, this is going to be a waste. But anyway, so they, but they go, and they talk to the elders about their need, you know. We won't take up much space. We'll use it at a time you aren't using it. We just want to use it for fellowship and prayer, okay. And um, so the, the elders of the, of the congregation hear their story and say, okay, you know, let's thank you very much, and we'll talk about it. And so they um, uh, began to talk about it and back and forth a bit. And then the pastor said, "Well, listen, let's let's wait. We'll we'll vote next week. Okay, let's everybody talk to people in the in the congregation. We'll we'll vote next week." So next week comes, and they get there, and so there was a good deal of buzz in the in the congregation about it. Kind of like, you know, what do you think? Blah, blah. And really, it was probably uh, you know fairly heavy against. Okay, and so it's kind of, that was kind of the plan everybody had going in, was that they would just vote and say, geez, we'd love to, but we can't. We'd love to, really. Um, so they get there, they're settling down, and there's a knock on the door. And it's this older woman who'd been teaching Sunday school in that parish, so that everybody on the parish, on the parish group had had her in Sunday school. Okay, she, long, long time. Okay, she knocks on the door and um, she asks if, you know, can I, can I please come in and speak to you for just a moment? And so, anyway, of course, they have to say yes. Yes, please come in. So she says, you know, you're talking about something really important here today. In fact, it was so important that all the Sunday school teachers met yesterday to talk about this last night, to talk and to pray about this. And I was sent from the Sunday school teachers to tell you that if you don't welcome these people in, then we can't teach Sunday school anymore. Because we cannot tell the children about the love of God and the Lordship of Jesus if we don't welcome the stranger. Well, I don't know what the conversation was like after this woman left, but they did. And that congregation then, for the next 50 years, 60 years, has been the place where the other is welcome. 
They were in the forefront of the civil rights movement. They've been one of the places where gay and lesbians have been finding refuge and a place to worship. Why? Because once you recognize the other, you can't not recognize them. You know what I mean? Once you see them, you see them everywhere. So once again, they began to see with hospitable eyes. They couldn't not see anymore. And they were compelled by the gospel to welcome. And then finally, becoming a hospitable parish. Um, the, as parish community, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure what this looks like actually. So I'll just put it out there. There's something I know. I know it's true for people. Do we need to practice giving from within our own need rather than from our excess? You know, I think many of us can be really hospitable with excess, with what we have left over. Um, but how do we speak about it in terms of what we have as what we need? You know, and what um, what you know, kind of our buffer, you know, against the onslaught of of a, of a questionable economy. Does that have an impact on what we on what we give? Okay, a look at hospitality. How is your own hospitality quotient with people in your community, with strangers to the community, and then with strange ideas? How hospitable are you to strange ideas, to strange beliefs or positions? That's a form of hospitality as well. How do we welcome people in? Um, and where is hospitality most clearly expressed in your pastoral setting, and how might that be enhanced? Excuse me, those are good questions. We're not going to, you know, have, we'll pick up on other questions later on uh, for a small, in, at your table. But I think that sense of hospitality and the challenge of that is really rooted in our own personal hospitality and our own willingness to, to welcome the other. And one of the ways, if we go back for a minute to that notion of our hospitality with strange ideas, positions, and beliefs, one of the places where that comes up is in the, is in the context of conversation. Okay, remember, these are going to be the poles that we're going to build, the framework for the dock, and then the dock that is our parishes that are an adult and, and evangelizing parish. Okay? Conversation. Again, conversation. You know, that goes everywhere from the, you know, the kind of all over the place chat that parents have while they're watching their kids play soccer, you know, um, to a, a confrontation or, or goodness knows, like a, um, you know, a television talk show kind of thing. All of that kind of gets named as conversation. So we have, you know, chat and the um, debate, argument, all of those get labeled under conversation. And I think for the most part, what we're really talking about here is either kind of this um, kind of not bad, but not terribly helpful kind of just chit-chatting, or often we have what's really just a series of monologues. You know, I talk, and then when I'm finished talking, you do your monologue, kind of regardless of what I said. My mother, my mother died this summer, my mother used to always say, and we would roll our eyes, of course, my mother would always say, that reminds me, okay? And that would be her way of totally changing the subject and doing her monologue, okay? <laughs> Um, and that, I mean, I think it's on, uh, many of us experience that. Oh, yeah, that reminds me, and then she's off. Okay, and you can count on whatever you were talking about not being seen again in that conversation. Um, that notion of, of, um, uh, of, of chat. A couple of resources there just to look at that are actually quite interesting on this and, and talk about how we begin to rethink this is uh, Deborah Tannen and, and Robert Keegan's books. Okay. And this connects very clearly with um, the, the material that um, John had talked about in terms of how, in terms of how um, Jesus was experienced, um, how God was experienced, yeah, in both in the Old and the, and the New Testament, in terms of conversation. We have that great conversation of God with Abraham. And it was actually shortly after the welcoming of the strangers. That great conversation about whether or not to save um, uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, one of the places, um, from fire. You know, kind of, and he kind of, he kind of argues God down. Okay. Well, suppose there were like fifty good people. Oh, okay. All right, All right. for fifty, yeah. Okay, for fifty, I'll save it. Okay, but what if one of them's out of town? Okay, there's only forty-nine. Then what? Okay, and eventually, just for one, for one good, for one faithful person, God would save the save the town. 
seems to me that when we're talking about conversation in scripture, we're talking about three things going on. First of all, both parties talked. Unlike the superego God, where basically we're told what to do, with this kind of notion, both parties talk. Okay? Both parties listen. In other words, there was a, there's an interchange there. The story of the um, woman at the well, I think, is a great example of that kind of, of an interchange. Or the story of the, of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. That interchange, that you say something and I say something. Jesus clearly responded to their question, or more deeply in the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus responded to their need, their, their um, confusion, their insecurity, their inner, their inner feelings was what he was responding to. And then the third is, the conclusion only came clear in the exchange. In other words, neither party knew how it was going to end till it ended. Do you see what I mean? So that there was a sense in which it's not like God is thinking all along, you know, I know I'm not going to burn the place down, I just make those kind of threats all the time, don't do it. But then he makes Abraham go through all these steps of, you know, how about 50, how about 48, 25, 11, 2, 1. Okay, but all, God wasn't going to do it anyway. You know, he's just pretending. It's a pretend conversation for God. I don't think that's true. You know? Or Jesus talking with various believers. It's not like Jesus is doing that as kind of a, an exercise or like an example. Okay? No, Jesus is doing it as a human being in conversation and doesn't know how it's going to conclude. We have that story of Jesus talking to the rich young man and we have Jesus, you know, kind of engaging him in a dialogue, and the young man basically in the end saying, oh, too much. And, we, and it says, Jesus looked at him with love. You know? Jesus was sad. Oh, he was really disappointed. It had been a really rich conversation, and he, Jesus really thought he, you know, this kid was really going to come along. And he didn't. Rats. I don't know if Jesus said rats, but rats. Okay. All right, conversation. Now, I think many, many of you who've heard me speak in other contexts know that um, I think John would probably agree with this. That really, most college professors have about four things they say. Three, really, three or four. John may have five. He's a full professor. So he may have five things he says. And the basically we just kind of repackage them in different packages based on what we're teaching. Okay, but basically there's really four. I thought I had a lot more to say when I first started teaching. In the I don't. Okay, but one thing that I say all the time, and one of my things to say, is that adults grow in their faith. Adults learn faith, learn in the full sense of learn faith, best in conversation with other adults about things that matter. That's how people grow in their faith, in conversation with other adults about things that matter. So that's where I think, oh, I'm going to skip that one, sorry. That's where I think we need to talk about conversation within kind of a parish setting and what it looks like. This is a quote from David Tracy, uh, yeah, Plurality and Ambiguity. Uh, those of you who are, most of you are alums, you probably recognize David Tracy, certainly. Um, Conversation is a game with some hard rules. Say only what you mean. Say it as accurately as you can. You can so you can't say it just to like make the point sound really good. You have to be accurate. Listen to and respect what the other says, however different or other. Your hospitality quotient, you know. Be willing to correct or defend your opinion if challenged by the conversation partner. Oh, darn. Be willing to argue if necessary, to confront if demanded, to endure necessary conflict, to change your mind if the evidence suggests it. See, conversation that we're talking about here, conversation is a very risky thing. It's risky not just because the other person might not agree with me, okay, but it's risky because I might have to change my mind. You know, that's the risky part. Genuine conversation means I might have to think differently about this or about this person. Okay, um, that's, and that's, that's risky. Okay, making conversation work, 
Um, again, we're talking about in a parish, uh, in a parish context. The first is have great expectations. That is, presume when you give adults the opportunity to talk to one another, they will and they'll talk about important things. Again, when I'm working with adults in a parish setting, one of the primary places I'm doing it right now is in sacramental formation. And as I'm giving them into, into small, opportunity for small group conversation, I say, you know, you're adults. You know, you get to talk about whatever you want to talk about. I'm not going to put a monitor in every, in every group or anything. I said, but let me tell you something. You can talk about the new soccer coach, the principal of the middle school, the, the uh, swine flu. You can talk about all that stuff almost anywhere. Okay. You can't talk about what you believe, what gives meaning to your life. I just, I find I can't do that stop and shop, wait for my number to be called at the deli counter. You know, I just, I can't do it, you know. And so this is an opportunity that you're not going to have again for a while, many times. So how do we say to people, this, so yeah, obviously you can talk about what you want to talk about. You're adults. Um, but boy, don't let this opportunity go by. And, and when said, said that way, many, many times, the conversation is really, is, is really a rich one. Okay? So that sense of have great expectations. Secondly, give it pride of place. Anytime we gather adults for absolutely anything, really, we ought to have opportunity for conversation about issues of, of faith. There's issues of anything that matters, that's faith. Okay, the things that are important to us, things that give meaning to our lives. What often happens is you're giving a, a presentation and the presentation goes over and so you cut out the conversation. Okay? It actually should be the other way around. Oops, I'm running out of time, so click through these, time for conversation. You, because we often have it as kind of what we do if there's time. And how do we think differently about that? Be sure that it's well hosted, um, and that gets to the next one, preparing good questions. Um, I think one of the hardest things to do, those of us who are engaged in religious education or pastoral ministry in any way, is to ask good questions. To repair good questions. As a matter of fact, that's, I'm teaching a, a weekend course, and that's one of the things we're going to be spending a lot of time on this weekend, um, is on how do we prepare good questions? Questions that aren't so fraught with church talk as to be unintelligible, that don't make presumptions about other people's homes or home life. So when you were growing up and your family had people over, okay, not necessarily. You know, so how do we ask questions in a way that people aren't already thinking, no, I can't do that. So if we ask how, um, oh, this is great. This was, uh, my kids were much little. I was living in Minnesota. And we were talking about standing around after church, getting our coats on, and um, one of the women who was very wonderful woman, wonderful, wonderful kids, wonderful, wonderful kids. Anyway, it was during Advent. And um, she comes up and she says, don't you just love seeing your come, come Emmanuel with your children while you do the, ad, you know, light the Advent wreath? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Advent wreath. I knew I forgot something. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> or we had an Advent wreath, but it's like, we didn't always remember, we didn't always remember it. Come on. You know, this is the real life. No, no, I, I don't. Okay, how do we ask questions, invite conversation in a way that isn't already putting another layer of, of guilt onto, onto, onto the adults in our parish community? Yes? And see, I would disagree with you, because while, while I think this is good for face-to-face, -face, I think much of the same model is used, and, and preparing good questions, having great expectations. If that's not in our, in our parish setting, that's just all, all I want to do for now, just because I don't have control over internet, I wish I had invested in it though, um, is to say, in what way do our parish websites 
genuinely invite conversation. Is there a blog with it? Yep. Is there, you know, is there opportunity for discussion? So that's all. I, I you know I'm, I'm really I'm little on my my little on my movements, but um, I just I've we have through um, school of theology and ministry we have a blog for catechetical leaders. You know, right now we're talking about books we read in in uh, in parish um, book clubs. You know, so I mean, I think we can still ask the good questions, and we need to presume. I mean, so it's one of the elements about the internet that we need to be more, more and more aware of is that it's got to be a two-way. It's not just what we say to the recipients of our website, but how is it? How does it form a dialogue? That's that's a good example. Okay. Let's take a um, interlude, as John so nicely says. Um, when do you experience this kind of conversation? Or where does conversation happen in your own pastoral setting? Okay, three minutes. Two, uh, two things on this. Um, one is I'm an introvert by, by kind of by nature. Okay, and um, and so I, in fact, when they talk about getting into small groups, I roll my eyes. Okay, I believe in this stuff and I roll my eyes. Okay. <laughs> Well, there has never been a time that once I've gotten into a small group that I don't really, really enjoy it. So it's like, I don't know why I do, but I mean, like, I just, I'm conditioned to kind of, oh my God, small groups. Um, and, but boy, you know, I just, and I think to see the energy and kind of the, really the intimacy in the way that, that John was talking about intimacy in that, in conversation, it's, uh, it's great. And we need to do it more. I remember someone saying to me one time, wasn't well, that kind of just the blind leading the blind, you know, adults in conversation, that kind of thing. And I said, well, it depends on the question. If you're asking about the understanding of a third century Armenian text, yeah, it's the blind leading the blind, you know? Or if you're asking specifically about the, um, the intricacies of a church teaching, yeah, I got, gotcha. But that's not what conversation is for. Conversation is about what does this mean for you and your life? Adult conversations ask the most important theological question we ask, so what? So what does this mean for your life, for how you raise your children, for how you spend your money, for how you engage in your community, for how you understand yourself in the world? That's the most important theological question we ask, ever. And that's what adult conversation is for. Okay, and adults have the capacity for, for finding the information they need to find. Okay, so it's not a, it's not essentially information giving, but rather a um, it's rather it's a transforming experience in the way that John was talking about. Okay, now let me talk about followership. Follower, boy, that has bad press, doesn't it? I mean, who wants to be a follower? Who wants your kids to be followers? You, know, you want your kids to be leaders? Um, ever to excel or whatever we say here. Okay. Contemporary usage, sheep, obedient, docile, right? This kind of follower, you know, kind of the, um, really put faithful in front of it. Faithful followers, oh man, and adults, really, okay? we don't want to be followers. If we look at scripture, however, the scriptures give us stories that invite a much more active, um, vital, compelling invitation to followership. The fundamental words of Jesus were, come, follow me, be a follower. Okay? Not go start your own show. Come, be a follower. We have in that high priestly prayer in John, which I'm just going to make mention to and tell you, oh, go read it again. It's a great, great, that sense of that those followers have become his friends, okay? But they're still his followers. They're followers. Okay? And the post-resurrection appearances have much the same tone to them. As followers, they were being sent out, but still as followers. 
So the images that we get from those those scriptures, and kind of as we, if we look at those and play with them, we can talk about three key ideas. First is the understanding of apprenticeship. Now you, you're going to notice. Let me just put this caveat on already. I'm not going to use the term discipleship here, okay? Not because I don't think this is what it is, but because we so overuse that term that I just want to, in order to really unpack followership, I want to avoid using kind of the terms we usually use. I believe that that's, this is discipleship, okay? Um, but I just, it's a different, different way, a new way of thinking about it. So we have this notion of apprenticeship. What does an apprentice do? I have a friend who was an apprentice to an iconographer. She was learned to be an icon maker. Um, and she said that what I really learned was not just how to make icons, but how to be an iconographer. You know? It's like how do you how do you attend to your tools, set the rhythm of your day, um, think about your work, um, live your life as an iconographer? How do those pieces go together? And that's that's at heart of the notion of apprenticeship. And that it's an apprenticeship to a way of life. So we're followers of a way of life, not followers of um, a set of beliefs. Again, if we once we move from that super ego God to a living God, being a follower is not so bad. If we're a follower to a, a super ego God, then we're following rules, we're following commands, we're following what we have to do. If we're a follower with a living God, we're in a relationship, a rich relationship. And finally, it's a, in each of these, it's a followership in which we're gathered to be sent. The, the point of following isn't just to follow, but to then be effective followers, be followers who, who bring that way of life out to others. With Adele Faith, this is a, an essay that I wrote in um, Prophetic Witness, Catholic Women's Strategies for Reform. With adult faith, the locus of one's, uh, one's, one's faithfulness shifts from receiving, uh, from received teachings, defined identity, and external authority. It shifts toward creating meaning within personally appropriated teachings, self-identity, and internal authority. So we're talking about faithful followers here. We're talking about people who are, are faithful not in the sense of faithfully following, but faithfully living. Um, just a second. That these women, but they're women who are faith. This is fostering the next generation of faithful women. They're women who are faithful in the process of being and becoming church. In other words, they're not necessarily. I mean, yeah, their their followership isn't following the church. It's following with integrity what it means to be and become an adult church. Does that make sense? You know, you get the difference? So that I think, you know, um, the notion of followership has been way underappreciated. One of my beliefs is that, um, and this is one of the places where I first began to really think about this, is when the whole um, sexual abuse crisis here in Boston and elsewhere came on, um, along with some poor leadership, there was some really poor followership. You know, there were a lot of followers who weren't challenging. There were a lot of followers who didn't raise issues. There were a lot of followers who followed what Father said, or what the bishop said. Now, I'm not saying then that, you know, they're, they're not culpable in the same way, obviously. But I think we need to be really careful of, if we're the church, then we're the church. And that means to be church is to be this faithful follower. Oops. Oh, I know it's expired. <laughs> it throws off my clicker. Sorry, I need to do it this way. I can't. There we go. Faithful followers. Faithful followers assume responsibility. They serve 
the vision and the leader see they serve the vision and the leader the vision first and the leader they challenge the leader in light of the vision and when necessary the vision itself does that make am I that making sense you see how this could be really rich yes Sue. Well, I think I think you have something behind that. Go ahead. Why don't you? Why don't you what are you singing? You know, there's a the discussion about being faithful. Of there, there's a let's just say the rich discussion. Yes. About being faithful and about identity. Right. So therefore, to be be able to identify yourself as a cat. Right. And then how do you learn how to do that? Now, once you learn what it means, you know what the definition. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then yeah, one I see. One who comes to experience with one's life, then it becomes a personal See, I think I think this gets back to the, much of the stuff that, that John was saying uh, in the first half of that the move. It seems to me you can't be a faithful follower, or it's a challenge. Yeah, no, you probably can't. You can't. It's it, there really isn't anything to be a faithful follower about if you have a, a super ego God and a super ego church. Does that, does that make sense? It's like super ego God, super ego church don't don't do that well with faithful followers. They do that way with followers. Okay, kind of blind followers, sheep, docile followers. But it, so that in order to do this, um, to engage in assuming responsibility, challenging, etc., that needs to happen. So that at some level, I don't know if there's a first and second, but there's a. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I think it's. I think it's a continuing moving through that. Um, that experience. Yeah. Okay. I want to invite you now. We have about ten minutes. Okay. Right. Um, and so I wanted to invite you into conversation at your table for about three or four minutes. And I, I know small times, not good. Bad example. I know. I know. <laughs> um, and then uh, you, we can raise questions for the whole group, and both John and I will be here to answer. Okay.